And that was largely the life of a pilot where you'd go out and work with any number of ground units at any given day, and you will never see that ground unit again. We would often fly with two Apaches at any given time. You would never, ever go out solo aircraft, and there's always two guys in an Apache. At least firing 30 millimeter, putting rockets out. Like, you don't know what happened. You don't know if the guys lived or died. BDA is pretty hard to assess, and you're limited to two and a half hours of station time with your fuel. So you're just evaluated every day very directly. The ability for a cross-border incident to spark some type of international incident was high. So I think that was just always on my mind with our guys flying when I wasn't there, like when I was in a command position. As I look back on it, there's no way I wouldn't have been disappointed either direction. Like yeah. Flew combat missions like my dad. He and I can connect on a different level because of that. Ladies and gentlemen, as always, it's both an honor and a pleasure to welcome my next guest to the podcast. He spent seven plus years as a U.S. Army Apache pilot. He uh, subsequently spent eight years with the CIA after that. He's the host of a wildly popular and entertaining podcast called Combat Story, which I was just on. Um, he currently works in the cybersecurity realm in the tech space. Ladies and gentlemen, he knows your browser history, even if you fucking delete it. <laughs> welcome to the stage, Ryan Fugit. Thank you so much for having me, Mike. Dude, thanks so, for coming, man. Uh, so we just knocked out a several hour interview where he was sitting here and I was on the couch, which was pretty awesome. Um, and I realized I need a new fucking couch when I sat over there. So uh, be on the lookout <laughs> for that. But um, what's the last full book that you've read? Oh, man. How are you going to come at me with this to yeah. start out? Got to do it. <sighs> So with the kids, we're reading Starship Troopers. So I got three boys, right. and this was gifted to us uh, because <laughs> I've got uh, 14 and 11-year-old who are really big into military history. Oh, nice. And so we had just read a, an older book together called The Defense of Duffer's Drift, which is about the Boer War. Mm. So I grew up in Africa for a portion of my childhood. Wow. And so as a family, we've always just been really interested in military history. And so this is a pretty interesting book that uh, an older brother of mine, I also have two older brothers, uh, got when he was going through uh, one of the advanced courses in the army. And it's about the uh, British in Africa and tr this guy, a uh, commander who has to relive the same battle because he screws it up every day. And when he goes to bed at night, he wakes up the next morning fresh with what he learned from the day before and then applies it. So it's kind of like, what terrain do you pick? How do you work with the locals? Um, how do you disguise your presence? So it's like a serious war version of Groundhog's Day. Yes, yeah, it that's is. cool. And it's real. It's a real short read, and my kids loved it. So I asked some folks, hey, what, what's another military book? And Starship Troopers was, was oh, nice. recommended. Well, that's cool. So we picked that up. Yeah. Do your, uh, do your boys ask you a lot about your time in the military and the CIA, or is that something that, uh, that they don't? They're starting to ask a bit more now, I will say. I mean, our oldest is 16, and he edited Combat Story for the first year. Oh, so nice. he's, he's big into the tech space and loves video production and that sort of thing. So he's heard a lot of the stories. Yeah, um, He could probably do without hearing any more. <laughs> but, um, yeah, the younger two are getting more into it, inquisitive. Yeah. And then every now and then something about the agency will come up yeah. where they're, they start to feel like they see more movies. And they're like, oh, what did we do? And yeah. You know, occasionally they'd go on ops with us and they just yeah. didn't know it because they were younger. Yeah. Um, so it That's was always wild. great to have the family with you yeah. as, as Dude, what a cover. Yeah, what a cool fucking part of their childhood. Yeah. That's awesome. What's the most disappointing thing about the CIA? I imagine it's, uh, it's like what people would say about the military where you see the movies and there's a lot of hair on fire, insanity, but for the most part it's pretty quiet, mundane, and frustrating a lot of the time. Yeah. At the agency, it's the paperwork. Yeah, um, You go and run an op, you come back, and you got to write up what happened, your route, the other person's demeanor, the intel, the finance, yeah. your receipts. I mean, that's the thing you never see in the movies yeah. that nobody wants to do. 
yeah, you I mean, gotta learn. Yeah, I mean the SEAL team is the same exact thing. It's like the the recruiting brochure is like seven percent of the job, you know, and the, yeah. and the rest of it's getting kicked in the nuts and laying in the mud <laughs> and, and filling out, you know, expense reports. Yeah. And, you know, yeah, building pallets. Uh, what's the best vacation you've ever taken? Um, man, that's a tough one. So I took. I will say I did some, I don't know if I'd call them vacations, but some of the work trips with the agency were fun. But um, family vacation wise, you know, we did a trip to Iceland that was pretty amazing. Um, with your kids or when you were a kid? Yeah, with my kids. Yeah. yeah. So we went there and toured the whole island and just, I've, it's one of the, you know, I've been to Malta. I don't know if you've spent any time there, yeah, but it's kind of a, I would say Iceland and Malta are fairly similar as I look at them. Just you almost feel like you're on another planet with the yeah. terrain and, and the way people I, act yeah. and speak. And Yeah, I have been to Iceland. and I, Yeah, I agree. I was like, where the fuck are we yeah. at? Are you sure we landed on the Earth? hills and yeah. The, yeah, the thermals, everything. Such a neat place, though. So just, I don't know if you saw it, two days ago, they had to close down. Did you go to the Blue Lagoon there? Mm -hmm. the, it's like a huge tourist trap. Um, but it's, a uh, you know, ice blue looking thermal area and you go in, in your bathing suit and they had to shut it down because they had something like 1400 really small earthquakes oh, really? over a two day period. Wow. Yeah. So Man, anyway, that's a crazy place. Yeah. Um, what's your morning routine like on a normal day when you're in town? Um, can I ask you to answer this too when I'm done? Cause you mentioned it yeah. when we were talking that you have a pretty specific routine. Oh, yeah. Sure. So, um, day to day, it's largely driven by my kids. Um, I wake them up at 6.30. So basically the only, if I want time to myself, it's before then. So I'll usually get up around 5.30. I'll work out. We have a gym in our garage. So I'll go down and work out for probably 20, 30 minutes. Um, and then I'll spend some time on combat story in the morning, whether it's um, editing, looking for a new guest, preparing for a new interview. I'll wake those rugrats up and then I'll go back and try to work a little bit more on combat story stuff until it's time to drive them to school. So where we're at in California doesn't have school buses. Mm. So, which is weird because I don't know how they're going to learn some of the things that you learn on a school bus yeah. as a kid, but it is fun because I get to drive them to school and spend a little more time. Yeah, with them. that's cool. Um, and then the day kicks off, but I'm curious. I'd like to hear yours because you mentioned yeah. it was a pretty specific ritual. It's, uh, I would say, bordering on un unhealthily uh, specific, but uh, I, I get up with the sun uh, almost without exception, unless I have to get up for a flight or you know for some other uh, thing, which I uh, honestly avoid at all costs. Like I, I do my damnedest to wake up when the sun comes up on purpose for the uh, the benefits from mm -hmm. that. Um, very first thing I do is I, I do a two minute cold shower or a cold plunge, depending on the time of the year. If, if it's in the winter time, I'll use the, the swimming pool cause it's 50 fucking degrees in there. Um, so I, I do a two minute cold plunge. Uh, I drink an, an LMNT salt water packet, uh, with about 20 ounces of water. And then I take 15 to 20 minute, about a mile of, of walking with uh, the sun in my eyes, no, no glasses, no headphones, and I just use that time to, to get sun in my um, in my eyes from a circadian standpoint. Same same thing with the waking up with the sun, uh, and to just get moving. And then I spend um, a fair bit of time, similarly in, in the garage gym, but just doing mostly mobility. I have a specific. There's a it's called a Cobra bag, which is a, a punching spring uh, spring bag mechanism that works on timing. I, I spend some time doing that. I do push-ups, uh, squats, dead arm hang for a minute and a half, and then a bunch of like mobility stretching. Um, and, you know, hip opening exercises and shit like that. And then I've got like one of those uh, knobby balls that I'll put on the wall and roll my, my back and shoulders out on. <clears throat> uh, from there, I go right in and I make two eggs over medium with uh, about six ounces of ham. Uh, and then I have coffee that I have, uh, you know, mud water and and uh, I do bubs, um, collagen, and MCT oil. Uh, I do some vanilla stevia uh, and some colostrum powder uh, after after I eat breakfast. Have that, and then start my day. So for like that first two hours, you know, pretty much every single fucking morning is that. Jeez, uh, but. If this is anything, um, an indication of how this interview is going to go, I got to step my game up. <laughs> That's pretty specific. No, it is. Well, I mean, like I was saying when you were interviewing me on purpose is that 
you know, like I've gone through phases of not being oriented to a routine in the morning and, and it makes a, an enormous difference for my mental clarity and acuity, my productivity, my, you know, motivation or drive. Like it just doing that every morning really sets my day up for when I'm done with that. Like I feel fucking amazing. Yeah. And for the rest of the day, I feel amazing. And then, you know, I, I don't have nearly as specific of a nightly routine, but it is specific. I mean, it's just, I, I go to bed a little earlier than probably most people. I'm usually in bed between nine and 10 and, you know, but I, but I have, you know, a specific oral regimen, you know, and, and showering and, and whatever, and, and just doing things to set me up for a good night of sleep, keeping the room cold, keeping it dark, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, starting and ending my day very intentionally, uh, has made a, a huge impact on my productivity. You know, um, it just, it just has, but what are the two key components for canine success? That's effective training and proper nutrition. Fueled by Team Dog brings those two components to your family and best friend. The perfect nutritional balance that results in a higher mental acuity, energy, overall vitality, and even an improved appearance. Every product you will find in my company's store was born from the battlefield and not from the boardroom. Let my life's work help you become your dog's hero. It didn't sound like you mentioned meditation or mindfulness, but it almost sounds like that's what it is, like For sure a version it of it. Yeah, yeah. It, it is. I mean, because I, I, I don't have music on or TV or, yeah. you know, during that time. So I, I have my thoughts and, and I like doing it that way a lot better than just sitting there thinking. Like I like to be doing something else also because I, I do think and, and kind of meditate and, and reflect, but I like to be stretching or, you know, whatever while I'm doing it. Yeah. Um, all right. So your childhood growing up. Uh, you spent some time in Africa. Walk us through kind of where you were born and raised and kind of the, the early formative years and how that shook out. Yeah, so my I lived overseas until I was about 13, 14 and came to the U.S. Um, and it was because my dad was a political officer in the State Department. Oh. So even though I was agency, he was true state. Um, but he also did a tour in Vietnam as a Huey pilot. So he had the army background, he stayed in the reserves, but he did his main career in the State Department as a diplomat. So I was born in Belgium, he was doing a tour in uh, uh, NATO headquarters and Brussels. So I was born there, spent a few years, and then several years in Zimbabwe, Southern Africa, um, where I picked up rugby and they just had the Rugby World Cup. So like we, our family, we follow it religiously oh, wow. to this day. And South Africa just won and that's the team, like if you you grew up in Southern Africa, like that's the big powerhouse team in rugby. And they just beat New Zealand, the All Blacks, which is incredibly yeah. hard to do. They won it just a few weeks back. So, so you guys kind were of partying. Cool. Oh, we were super excited. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it was great. It was hosted in France. The time zones worked out really well. We could watch everything and had the kids watch in. They were all into it. So that's cool. Um, yeah. So grew up in Zimbabwe and then Pakistan for four years got evacuated out during the Gulf War actually, and went to live with family in uh, Chicago. So that was kind of my first experience of America wow. was a couple months, it was six months in Chicago, and then went back to Pakistan. And my dad finished up his overseas time there and we moved to Tampa for his last job, which was the political advisor to the commander at CENTCOM. So we spent a ton of time like going over to the Middle East from there, but I was the last of the three boys in the family and they just wanted to give me some stability. Yeah. So I went to one high school basically in Tampa. Yeah. So, I mean, that must've been, I mean, really no different than somebody being from another country and moving here. How big of a shell shock was that going to American high school after growing up that way? Pretty big. And actually the way you described your high school experience, mine was fairly similar. So it was a very big public school in Florida, half black, probably 40% white, probably 10% Cuban background, uh, Latino. And I was accepted very quickly because I played sports. Like I grew up playing sports, just like swimming, rugby, tennis, everything. And I couldn't wait to get to the States to play football. So I was playing football like in eighth grade. And so I was, I was at least accepted among people of different backgrounds. So I wasn't ever targeted, but it happened at our school yeah. a bit. But it definitely was a shock. Like uh, one of the, the the girls that I started dating 
I went over to her house and her parents were like, oh, we thought you'd be black because you lived in Africa. It's like, <laughs> nope, no, no, I'm a white guy. Oh, that's uh, fucking wild. No, Man, yeah, what it was a, what a, Yeah, I can imagine. I mean, what, a, what an interesting way to grow up. And so, I mean, taking a couple steps back, what what's your first memory of childhood? Where were you in Zimbabwe or, or do you remember any of Belgium? I, I remember a, a tiny bit. I was probably three, three and a half. Um, I was in this parade in Belgium, like cold weather, which is what Belgium's all about, like yeah. rainy, overcast. And it was um, it's like a costume, almost Halloween type parade. I do remember that. But most of my early memories are a, a British Catholic school in Africa. Wow. Yeah. What was the living situation like there? Pretty spectacular, I got to say. So Zimbabwe is a, a pretty terrible place today. It's just been run into the ground. But early 80s, like throughout the 80s, it was the gem of Southern Africa. Um, great economy, beautiful, safe. Um, my dad at the time was the number two at the embassy. It's a fairly small embassy, but still he was higher up at that time. So like we had a great house. We had staff that worked in the house. Like we host dinner parties three nights a week for diplomats from the community, business wow. folks. So like I'd wake up at night and walk out to like get a drink and I'd walk through a, a diplomatic reception, Jeez. which is kind of weird. I mean, that's yeah. not how most people grow up. I will say one of the ways, and you probably saw this when you were in Iraq, probably going into certain houses, we had a wing of the house in Zim that had, um, that was gated off so you could seal it in case there was a break in or uh, some type of an attack. So that was a little bit weird growing up with, hey, before everybody goes to sleep, make sure you lock this door yeah. so nobody breaks in and tries yeah. to kill us at night. Not that that was a huge problem at that time in Zim, but yeah. the 70s and then later on, late 90s, it would have been. What uh, what happened to make it go so downhill? Like what ran it into the ground? So we, like the international community and the U.S., helped install this guy named Robert Mugabe in 1979, 1980. Um, when they transitioned from white to um, black rule in uh, Zim. And he was, by all accounts, going to be a great leader. And he, like many people, just got corrupted by power. Um, and he just refused to let go. He only died a few years back. I mean, he ran that place into the ground. So people who are familiar with Zimbabwe will know like the, the inflation they've had there is some of the worst in the world. Like you have to have a wheelbarrow to move currency around to buy bread. Wow. Uh, it's really bad. And it's sad because they have um, like one of the wonders of the world, the Victoria Falls is there. They have this thing called Great Zimbabwe, which is like thousands of years old, like early humans and a little area that they built up. Um, wildlife is like, Kenya, Tanzania, Botswana, South Africa. I mean, one day that place will be great again and people will go back and just be amazed. Yeah. Did you go to Lake Victoria when you were there? Yeah, um, we went there. We'd go to Victoria Falls. Um, I was bitten by a small crocodile when we were there. Really? Um, yeah, I mean, it's very much like we'd go and camp out in the, uh, in the bush. You'd have elephants walking by. I mean, it was very much old school. Not as many safety precautions. Yeah. Is there a favorite thing about uh, living there that comes to mind? Yeah. I mean, that to me was a really special time in my life. I don't know what it was with the way my folks were at the time, my brothers, like even the school, the school was pretty strict. Like they're hitting you, um, British Catholic type school, but, um, I just really liked the freedom. Like we had a pretty big property. It was all fenced in, but I would run around that place all day playing army, um, climbing trees. The guy who lived next to us was a British guy who was, if you've ever seen like a James Bond movie, the guy Q, the guy who comes yeah. up with inventions, mm -hmm. that was the guy's dad. So <laughs> me and this kid, this British kid would play together and yeah. his dad was like a former <clears throat> Q guy. Wow. Um, yeah, so it was just being around, like being outside. I never wore shoes. Like the only time I would wear shoes was to go to school. Yeah. And then as soon as school's over, you take them off and you're just running around barefoot. We played rugby barefoot, Yeah, everything. How old were you when you moved from there to Pakistan? Um, God, I was probably nine, nine or 10 nine or by 10. then. Yeah. Is it 
I imagine a huge culture shock moving to Paris. Yeah, that was my first experience with the Muslim world. And yeah. uh, was, was that kind of a depressing shift or was it a cool, cool part of your childhood also? A little bit. It was really, I think by that time, and, and you know, back when we were younger, 10 and 11, like we had more freedom even yeah. there. So my parents would let me ride my bike 20 minutes from where we lived in the suburbs through downtown Islamabad to the embassy compound. Jesus. Ridiculous. Yeah, it's crazy. So uh, again, like probably not the best parenting move, but it, <laughs> it, it's great when you have to figure, like as you and I were talking about, figuring stuff out on your own later. That was really helpful. So they were finishing building the house we were going to live in. So like when school was over, I would ride my bike and sit on a construction site and read comic books while they were building our house. And then I'd live in it, um, you know, uh, about six months later, that's where we live. And I just felt like I had a lot of mobility. I didn't feel at risk yeah. until after the Gulf War. When we came back, things had really changed. The kind of uh, locals soured on Americans yeah. after that. Was it a similar, similar living environment in terms of centered around the embassy? And It, it was actually. The property was a lot smaller. Um, in Zimbabwe, like, People were in pockets around town, and so you drive to different houses. Here, there were a lot of diplomats in the same area, a very affluent part of town. So we didn't have as much space, but the house was still very nice. We still entertained. Um, so I, I guess that was similar, and we'd yeah. take a bus to school, that sort of thing. Yeah. And uh, so you, you go back there. How long were you there before you moved to or uh, Yeah, to Chicago. We were there probably about a year when uh, the Gulf War kicked off. Yeah. So I had a bunch of friends, local kids, and we were at an inter international school. So, you know, all the diplomats kids were there, all like the really wealthy politicians yeah. kids, the business folks. So I, I ended up close with everybody, played sports all the time, and then uh, got evacuated out. Yeah. Um, and then you ultimately end up in Tampa. You go to co uh, high school there. Mm -hmm. uh, any other things stand out as being kind of culture shock like I mean was was America what you expected or was there things that were really surprising I mean I had read Friday Night Lights back when I was in Pakistan and like all right so America's fully centered around cheerleaders and football teams and, yeah. and Florida was a lot like that yeah. like not too too far off but I initially started in the kind of like the normal um, academic level and I mean, it was at, to your point, like when we were talking, people are, they're not paying attention. They're playing cards while the teacher's talking. They're just doing their own thing. Sometimes they don't show up to class. That was a culture shock. Yeah. I had just grown up in like pretty strict um, academic environments. Yeah. And these were just totally different. Yeah. Like fucking prison. Yeah. Um, so you played football. Um, where, where was the, the draw or kind of the light switch moment for you where you decided that you wanted to, to join the army and, and as you progressed through high school was serving something that you had wanted to do for a long time or? Yeah. I mean, it was really just part of how we grew up. I mean, we joke, my brothers and I joke, like when we lived in Belgium, we felt like we had fought at the battle of the bulge. Like we yeah. went to visit every, anytime my mom kicked us out of the house, he's like telling my dad, just take these boys somewhere else. Like we'd go to a battlefield. So we just grew up around it. Um, you know, my dad would have his medals and whatnot, like in a small case on a bookshelf that I'd take a look at every now and then. So for my brothers and I, I think it was very much like we were just expected to go and yeah. serve. Um, I don't know if there was a light bulb moment, but a lot of similar to the way you described it, like I read the Marchenko books as well, grew up with G.I. Joe. Like that's what I play with overseas. My experience of America was like, what, this is G.I. Joe, very patriotic. Um, and, and I just saw myself going down that route. Um, I would do college, ROTC, and then go into the army. That's, but I will say, it, it, I, I should say this because I'm sure like my mom has called me out on this. I really wanted to be a SEAL for really? a long, like a lot of guys, I don't know what it is, reading the books, the challenge. Yeah. Even during the Gulf War, like, um, you know, I feel like there were more notoriety after uh, the movie Navy SEALs. But um, my dad was an Army aviator. My older brother went in the Army. And so I was really conflicted when I was choosing. So I, I got a Navy ROTC scholarship. I got an Army one and in the end just picked Army. And I think there, 
as I look back on it, there's no way I wouldn't have been disappointed either direction. Like yeah. flew combat missions like my dad, he and I can connect on a different level because of that. Yeah. You know, had I, had I gone another route, would I have made it? I don't know. Um, but I wouldn't have had that connection. So yeah. it's one of those points in my life where a serious departure, either direction I yeah. went. Yeah. Uh, where did you go to college? Uh, up in DC, I went to Georgetown. Oh, really? Um, <clears throat> Real shit, shithole school. Yeah, so I tried to get in. They denied me, and then I called the football coach and then got in. Mm. So I played football there only That's so I could get into the school. Oh, really? Yeah. What position did you play? I was a tight end and long snapper. So I was fine in high school, but even at that, I mean, that's a 1AA program. Um, and I think a lot of people are like, whoa, didn't even know Georgetown had football, which yeah. is a very common uh, remark, but like all the guys I played with were all state wherever they played were just like four or five inches shorter yeah. and about 60 pounds lighter than you need to be to play at that next level. Yeah. And it's so <clears throat> evident when you get to the next level, like phew, even for me, I couldn't even play at that level. Like yeah. I played all four years, but I wasn't a standout at yeah. all. Yeah. That's interesting. I mean, uh, I, I actually toured Georgetown uh, two years ago, maybe. I'd never been there, but uh, it was a neat, neat campus. Yeah, Be I mean, beautiful area. And uh, what was, what, what do you look back on most fondly about being there? I mean, nine eleven happened when I was there, mm. so like I could see the smoke coming off of the Pentagon. Oh, so it was wow. pretty memorable, I guess, yeah. from that standpoint. Um, a lot of, a lot of my friends from the football team, like I mean, you know how it is when you're a part of a community like that. We were really tight. At yeah. that time, um, very few other folks were in ROTC or going to join the military pre 9-11. Um, but several guys on the team who would never, ever have gone in the military yeah. enlisted yeah. after 9-11, yeah. which I always thought was really cool. Yeah, for sure. Um, and then the last thing I would say is that the guy who commissioned us, so we were the first class to get commissioned after 9-11. So, um, the guy who commissioned us was General Casey. So oh, he had wow. been a cadet and student at Georgetown. His dad was the highest ranking person to die in Vietnam um, previously while he was at Georgetown. So kind of that, I, I just remember, was pretty cool, him sending us off into this new war at the yeah. time. Was there any um, waffling or uneasiness in terms of, you know, deciding that that's what you want to do prior to 9-11, 9-11 happens? Did, did that change your perspective at all, making you want to do it even more or making you question it? Or, or what was your thought process? I th probably like a lot of guys, I was once nine eleven happened. I was just like, "How can I get there even faster?" Like, yeah. what's the? F and I had already been locked into aviation at that time, at, which is a very long pipeline. Yeah, and that worried me because in the back of my mind was the Gulf War, and like this thing's going to be over in yeah. months. I'm going to miss this. All these other guys are going to have this experience. So yeah. I think for me, it was more of a catalyst. Like I wanted to get in there even faster. Yeah, I, yeah, I certainly understand that. All right, as you guys know, I used to dip when I was in the military, uh, as a lot of us do. Um, the tradition of it and just the ritual, uh, which the enjoyment that comes from that is significant and not one that I uh, particularly like to give up, uh, as I know a lot of my brothers in arms uh, tend to feel the same way, which is why I like Black Buffalo. It's got two product types, which are uh, long cut and pouches. They're made from the same base ingredients, which is edible green leaves, food grade ingredients, and no tobacco leaf or stem. In both of those formats, you can get wintergreen, mint, straight peach, or blood orange, um, and it's just a it's a phenomenal product that uh, you know is tobacco free. Uh, they also have nicotine uh, pharmaceutical grade nicotine versions and nicotine free versions if you want to ditch the nicotine as well. Um, you know, it's, it's something that I've I've enjoyed and and been able to transition off of dip from. Uh, and it's something that, um, in terms of honoring that ritual and, and getting that same feeling uh, of having that ritualistic dip, is uh, is pretty awesome. So, go to blackbuffalo.com uh, for your introductory package and uh, get twenty percent off with code Mike Drop. That's blackbuffalo.com twenty percent off code Mike Drop. Warning. This product contains nicotine. Nicotine is an addictive chemical. Black Buffalo products are intended for adults age 21 and older who are consumers of nicotine or tobacco. Speaking of that pipeline, so you get commissioned, uh, you go through all of your basic stuff first, and then you end up in flight school. Um, 
fairly recently I had an F-18 pilot on. We talked a little bit about flight school. What was your experience there with it? I mean, it's a very long program, and it doesn't weed people out the way, like, BUDS and, and your training do. They, I think they spend a lot of time selecting people before they can get into that pipeline and weeding a lot of folks out. But it's not physically demanding. I think pretty much anybody can learn to fly with enough time, if I'm yeah. being honest. Not F-18s. So I'm speaking strictly yeah. rotary wing here, folks. But, I mean, that's um, a whole different area of expertise, too, yeah. though. I mean, that. It, it seems even more so like if you look at it from an art versus science or a combination of the two is that there's there's more of an art to flying a helicopter yeah. than, than there is. Uh, I mean, maybe the fighter pilot guy is a little more so artful and that there's a lot of acrobatics and what have you, but there's a lot of shit going on with a helicopter. You know, actually, having interviewed some of these fast movers, like uh, gun pilots, they you seem to want to be a bit younger the reflexes and your reaction time is so important in yeah. in a fast mover. It's almost the opposite in helos where like when we were in Afghanistan, we had a National Guard unit tacked onto our task force. And there was a guy from the Maryland National Guard who had flown Chinooks in Vietnam. No kidding. And this is 08. That guy's control touch was out of this world. Yeah. Like you don't need the reaction time there. It's the art side of it and manipulating the controls and understanding space. Yeah. That's really useful. So the older that the pilot is in a helicopter, the safer you probably are. So it's, it's almost more it's like a surgeon's touch of, yeah. of the finesse. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's fascinating. Uh, did you find flight school challenging? Yeah. I guess as you were asking that question initially, the thing that's surprising, it shouldn't be surprising, but just having never gone through something like that, you're just evaluated every day, very directly. Every, like you take a test every week for 14 months, like a written exam on something like the aircraft parts, aerodynamics, uh, meteorology, weapon systems. And then every single time you fly, you sit down with one person, your instructor pilot, and he just goes through a list of what you screwed up and yeah. you never did anything exceptionally. Like yeah. you may have done something correctly, yeah. but it's usually like, this is bad. That's bad. And so it just really reinforces that learning mindset. Yeah. Very similar to the agency and how they go through training. So I think that was surprising. Like the grind of having to perform yeah. each day, knowing you're getting rated. What's the, the simplest, most Reader's Digest version of how to fly a helicopter that you can provide? So, again, like, I, it would be so interesting to hear an F-18 pilot. You know, like, I don't know if, if they dis describe that. Like, flying straight and level is one thing. Like, you can hop on the controls and keep that thing flying and probably not kill anyone. But what, to understand the, the basics of flying, like, you have to understand how to hover and that takes six to eight hours on the controls, no matter who you are as a human. So like the most skilled person is still going to take six to eight hours. And then eventually you get it and it's like a bike. But I, I guess the way I would describe it is when you're hovering, you have to manipulate three controls simultaneously. And back when like my dad and the Huey pilots back in the day and Cobra pilots, there were four axes, but now there are three. So you got a cyclic, the kind of joystick, a collective on your left side, it's up and down and then pedals for your feet. And every time you make an input with one of those controls, you have to immediately make a corresponding input on the other two at the same time, every one of them, like slightly thereafter. And that's what takes the time to learn. So as like the cyclic, you make a, a slight input, like to the left, that's going to tilt your rotor disc and move you left. But at the same time, it could drop you and tilt the nose. So you have to apply a little collective. As you do that, it increases the pitch of the blades in the rotor. Um, so now you have to manipulate the pedals a little bit more to stay straight so you're not off axis. And then all of that repeats and compounds very quickly. So, uh, so that's hard. That's the hard part about it. So like to compare it to fixed wing, it's, it's more fixed wing seems more one dimensional and rotary seems a little more three dimensional. Yeah, I mean, I'd be afraid of somebody hearing that snippet and me sounding like, Being like what the fuck? <laughs> you guys you know? got it easy. Yeah, I, I would say um, 
like a fixed wing pilot trying to hover is going to go through that same problem. Yeah. If you take a pilot, like a, a rotor wing pilot and drop them in a fixed wing aircraft and tell them to go land, you can land at speed. Could you land on an aircraft carrier? No. Yeah. Like you want to land a jet on an aircraft carrier? Yeah, my, like my feeling is that is like four dimensional yeah. type of environment at night. Like yeah. that is really, really hard. Yeah. That's like next level. Yeah. Hearing you describe uh, the inputs for a helicopter, though, makes me even further marvel at the TF-160 guys that the shit that they do in some of those helicopters at night on night vision getting shot at, you know, and the precision with which they can direct those helicopters and the yeah. conditions they do is fucking mind boggling. Yeah. Uh, I'd love to get one of those guys on. Oh, man. I got several, man. Seriously. Yeah. Like, oh, I'd love to have yeah. them on. Yeah. Um, all right. So 14 months, uh, and then you're in, in your unit or. Yeah. Kind of, um, I don't know what it is now. Like 10 to 12 months basic. And then you do several months for your advanced aircraft. So you kind of progress and yeah. then you, get pushed to Blackhawks, Apache, Chinooks, Kiowas at the time, and Lakotas now. Do you get a choice with that? Yeah, so that's all order of merit based. Yeah. So end of all the training. And that's why the, there's so much pressure every time you get evaluated. Like yeah. the difference between what aircraft you're going to fly in your entire career yeah. is dictated by a couple percentage points, you know, tenths of a point. So if you want to end up on Kiowas, keep fucking up. Right? That's, that's right, man. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, that's just being honest, right? Yeah, I mean, that's pretty no. much the rub. Uh, so obviously, if you were an Apache pilot, you did well. And So for our class, we got two Apaches out of 30, and they went one and two. Yeah. Like, But some classes I've heard, people will skip those, like guys want to be Chinook pilots. Like oftentimes, folks who come out of special ops as door kickers, when they get into aviation, they'll go directly to Blackhawks or Chinooks. Yeah. It, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's a feeling of... Uh, just being closer to, to the, like the guys who are in yeah. the back and like having been there. Um, one of the guys, in fact, who, you know, I definitely recommend you have him on Mike Rutledge. He was in my, yeah. do you know him by any chance? I, I've spoken with him about coming on and we've uh, gone back and forth trying to schedule it and, and haven't been able okay. to yet, but great guy. He was in my flight school class. Oh, wow. So it was really honestly intimidating. I'm like 23 at the time this dude has a trident on and yeah. we're going through training together. Like, yeah. Jesus. Christ. But he went right into one sixtieth, which yeah. is super rare. Yeah. That's fucking cool. Um, during that 14 month flight school, do you do any armament training at, at that point or is it all afterwards in terms of shooting? Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know about the, I'm sure the Kiowas do too, but um, for Apaches, we'll go out to the range once, once we're there, we'll shoot, rockets we'll shoot 30 millimeter we won't shoot hell i mean it's rare to shoot a hellfire but usually if you're shooting a hellfire it's your first time doing it is in yeah. combat which oh, is wow. also not what you want oh, but shit. the reality of it i mean what why is that the range um what is it called when you're on a range and the like the max effective you know the cone that you have with a hellfire it's enormous okay like that so there's just very few need. places you can yeah. shoot oh, okay and they're caught, they, they're yeah. expensive. I still think, I feel like you should at least shoot one. I before, would agree. You know, I mean, but what what's the max payload that an Apache can carry? So, I mean, it, it depends. Altitude is is a killer for, um, for rotary wings. So if you're operating in Afghanistan, like we were on an Apache, we typically, typically carry two to maybe four Hellfires. We'll carry, oh my God, 24 to 36 rockets. I probably got that one slightly off and about 300 rounds of 30 millimeter. 300? Yeah. yeah. The uh, the rockets, what's the explosive weight on those? Do you know? So the weight, we don't, um, we wouldn't ever talk about them in that context, but we'd have different tips on them. Um, so you could have like a two meter blast radius, for, depending on what you're using. We would fire flechettes, which mm -hmm. have like spinning pieces of shrapnel that kind of, fragment out um but we'd also have like he yeah that sort of do you know what the hellfires have how, how much explosives they've got in them no uh, only because it's been too long Th those are the kinds of things that we get like yeah at, anytime Ballpark. an ip comes along you know like so max range on them i'm curious like what like probably you could probably shoot them seven k's 
and super accurate, I assume. Super accurate, but surprisingly less lethal yeah. than you might expect. So there's not a lot to them. There's not, and I think just the, f especially in that place where we're, where we were all fighting, um, the the soil really absorbs a lot of that blast. Yeah. Um, so like there are times where we fire them near people and they'd walk away from them. Wow. Um, surprisingly, but if you hit a building, like you could take that thing down depending on the the warhead you had on it. Yeah. Uh, and the 30 millimeter, I mean, that's no fucking joke. No. And we'd fire those typically in like a 10 round burst yeah. and you only had 300 of them. So yeah. like, it sounds like a lot, but it goes no. quick in a fight. Yeah, no, for sure. Especially when it's uh, as fast as they, yeah. they go cyclic rate wise. Um, so when, when you left flight school and got into uh, your first unit, what was the, the turnaround time from the time you showed up until you actually deployed? surprisingly long for me. So I ended up going to Germany to a unit that had literally the week I got there redeployed from OIF one and they got beat up fairly badly in that fight. Um, it was supposed to be this, the, the Apache longbow, like the new version of the Apache was kind of being showcased at this time. And they fought with more of our like Gulf war, cold war tactics and got shot up quite a bit in that rotation. Yeah. Didn't handle the brownout, takeoff and landings with the sand very well. And so the the morale at that unit was pretty stinking low, I will say, which was hard to, it was a little hard to, to watch coming in. And I was definitely the new guy without a combat patch. So they did not redeploy for three years. Wow. So I went, so I got there in 03, I didn't deploy until 07. Holy shit. Yeah. And were, you, were you doing a, a lot of training? Yeah, I mean, we'd fly as much as you can. On the conventional side, you don't fly as much as you do for 160th by yeah. any means. You don't shoot as often. So you'd have gunnery maybe once or twice a year. And you're flying minimums, like, just to make sure you're still qualified wow. to get out there and fly. So you do your platoon leader time, then you go to staff. So That's I mean, so terrible. What, what the fuck are you doing otherwise then? I mean, so for me, at least... The th one of the things I disliked most about my time in the army was the garrison environment, like deployed, very interesting dynamic, but garrison is just painfully slow, like maintenance, the way you had described, uh, you gotta have 18 people sign off if you want to do anything. Oh, yeah. Like you want to reposition an aircraft from one part of the airfield to another for a static display for a school. It's like a colonel's got to sign off on it. Yeah. Um, but you're still flying. Like we go fly in the Alps, which is pretty cool to yeah. start getting familiar with the altitude. Um, we'd, we'd come up with mock missions that we could run. We'd fly at night as much as you can, like getting yeah. familiar with FLIR and night vision and going back and forth. Yeah. All of that. From an altitude perspective, is, is it very linear in terms of the effect that it has on thrust or is there a at this level, it's not that bad, and then it's like a fucking light switch where it's like, holy shit, this thing operates way different now. No, it's pretty linear. Yeah. Um, so the altitude, the temperature, and the weight are all tough factors. So yeah. like in Germany, it's easy to fly there. Um, back at Campbell, super easy. When you get into like Colorado, high altitude, or you're in Afghanistan, and you're taking off from a small fob where you don't have a runway, you're all gassed up. You've got all your weapons load. That is nerve wracking. So like trying to take off without destroying an engine and crashing is, is like, that's all that's going through your head as you're taking off. And as you're coming into land, like hopefully you've bled off all of your fuel, you're lighter, but even coming into land to a small fob is Tricky. contentious. Yeah. What, uh, what's the biggest impact that altitude has on, I mean, I know weight, and, uh, uh, and temperature do too, but like what, what's the, the most significant change? Basically how much purchase the blades can get in the air, like the air is so thin. So the higher elevation you get, the engines aren't as, as powerful or effective. So it's kind of like a, when a transmission is going out on a car, like it just nothing works as well. Yeah, pretty yeah. much. And, yeah. and it's funny you say that, like we'd have two engines on the Apache and uh, one transmission. So I still remember one of my instructor pilots, one of the first guys who taught me, like an early instructor pilot, he was going through a divorce, smelled like whiskey almost every day, <laughs> which is not what you want yeah. from your IP. 
Oh shit. But he, I remember him saying, he's like, Ryan, we can lose an engine and still live. Cause you can auto rotate to the ground. It's like, if we lose a transmission, we're fucked. Yeah. And what I just the, remember him saying that. Oh man, that's nerve wracking. What, what are the engines in there? <sighs> They're Rolls Royce seven. Uh, for us, it was 701, like jet turbine engines. Do you know what, is it, is it horsepower rated? Yeah. What? I, I don't remember the horsepower rating. Ballpark? I mean, is it thousands? Yeah. Or? Thousands. Um, I just can't remember it anymore. Yeah. And what's funny is, as you mentioned, transmissions. One of the other things that happens early in flight school is they bring you into a room about this size and they've got, they've got an engine up on the wall. They've got a transmission. I had never seen even a car engine really? by the time I got there. Oh, shit. So like some kids grew up with their dads working on cars. Yeah. Some of them had flown already. I was like starting from square one. Yeah. Well, there's no bad habits. That. At least. That's so, true. Like yeah. I'm only learning this. Yeah. 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 Um, how many, how many gallons of fuel w will it hold max? Man, you're asking me all these hard questions. All right, Zach, I'm going to have to remember this. These are, <laughs> might have to insert something in the yeah. description here. I mean, ballpark? No, I got nothing no for idea. you. 230. Yeah. That's what Do you I know what say. kind of fuel it is? is JP8. It? JP8. Yeah. What's the difference between the different JPs? Do you know? No, I mean, I know, like we, I was talking with another, uh, an F-16 pilot about some of the fuel and JPA versus eight and five. Yeah. I, I don't know what additives that they have in there. I mean, my, my assumption would be like racing fuel for bikes and cars is that it's just octane levels, you know, but it's like at the pump, you've got, you know, 89, 91, 93 in some states, yeah. you know, 91 is, is the max. Race fuel is like 100 or 105 or 110 or 112, you know, depending on what it is. Uh, that would be my guess. I, I don't know. I don't know. Shit it's probably it. similar. Yeah. 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 But um, all right. So once you finally find yourself overseas, uh, what was going through your mind where you're like, okay, I mean, at this point, it's been several years of, of getting to that point. You know, post 9 11, you're working on six years. Yep. From the time it happened, you're like, how the fuck do I go smack the man around? Yeah. And, and now you're finally there. How did that feel? Yeah. Um, I mean, it was kind of a double-edged sword where I was so excited to go. But at that time, I had my first kid, you know, my wife. So I think it just takes on different meaning when you're kind of in a hairy situation. You've got that to think about. But yeah. I, I was excited to be there. And I mean, I had spent four years of my life in Pakistan yeah. and here we are, like I was posted in coast at Fob Salerno, like right on the border, um, AFPAC border. I knew that region very well. Like the month before we got there, Benazir Bhutto is this like really significant leader in Pakistan's history was assassinated. Um, like i had studied the Russians in Afghanistan and their aviation units. So like I was really, really excited to be there at that. I was with the 101st, like great unit, like great history. So I was excited to be there. And then we did nothing. Is that the, uh, <laughs> um, I, well, I was on staff initially, so it felt like we were doing nothing. Yeah. Um, probably the, f sorry, man, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, did, did the, did spending years there as a child and, and the amount of knowledge that you had that for sure is going to be far and above what all the other guys you're there with. Did that play a, an integral or advantageous role or was it just kind of a, an asterisk? I, I think as a pilot, it was less important. Yeah. Certainly if I was on the ground, like having grown up with people of different clans and languages, I, I think that would have been more helpful. I will say like we were constantly flying around the border and just having grown up around, you know, my dad and politics and international relations, the, the ability for a cross border incident to spark some type of international, like really bad incident was high. So I, I think that was just always on my mind with our guys flying when I wasn't there, like when I was in a command position, um, not wanting us to go and light something up in Pakistan without authority, knowing how volatile that could be. Yeah. Um, on that first deployment, did you get, you said you were staff. I mean, did you fly much I, or? Yeah, yeah, no, I did. So I was staff for the first two months or so. And probably the first time I had to just completely not follow an order and do something for myself where we were at Salerno, which is somewhat outlying base away from Bagram where everything was going on. And you couldn't 
fly certain missions until you got this one briefing, but it was only given at Bagram. And it was given to all the line pilots, as it should be. And then if you're a staff pilot, it was really hard to get into this course. And I just, one day I was like, I asked my our S3 if I could go. He's like, nope, can't go. You got to be here and planning. And I knew if I didn't go, I was never going to fly. So I just hopped on a flight without authorization, went up to Bagram, slept in the middle of nowhere on Bagram overnight, and just walked in and took this course the next day and flew back and got chewed out. But then, like, I was given a command a couple months later in Salerno, and I, like, I was able to fly, really, because of that. So I ended up flying a lot more starting early on in that deployment because of that. Yeah. For the listener, can you uh, explain the difference between staff and line? Yeah. Um, One is like a purgatory, almost hell position that no aviator wants to be in. No officer really wants to be on staff, but you do it because you have to. Um, The line companies are the tip of the spear of any aviation element, any like military element, I would say. So these are the folks who are flying in an aviation unit. You're flying all the time. These are the experts. It's where the warrant officers are. Um, like you, you own the aircraft, the maintainers, the pilots, your mission planning, you're flying. That is the job that you thought you signed up for. As an officer though, every few years, you got to bounce from a pl- platoon leader where you're leading in the, the company to a staff position where you're planning missions at a higher level, you're doing logistics, you're doing admin, human resources stuff, and it's just painfully boring. You're not flying. It's Nobody wants to fly with you because you don't fly as often, so you're more dangerous. Yeah. Um, and you really have to win over the line pilots so they want to bring you on flights. Yeah. So you get uh, – I appreciate you clarifying that. So you get uh, – you start to fly more on a line status. Um, do you remember your first combat mission? I, I do. Yeah, it, it was certainly not like yours. Mine was very mundane, but I think like a lot of guys, when the first time you go out the outside the wire, you're just like, assume world war three is going to break out on your watch. Yeah. Like you're going to be shooting all kinds of places. And in, at least w- when we were there in Afghanistan, I would say this is largely true Iraq and Afghanistan post nine 11. Apaches are very much on QRF. Like you get called a lot, but you don't know where you're going to get called. And if you're not called somewhere, you'll go and run just a recon mission to, to see if you can support a ground unit that's got a convoy or a fob that just needs you to go look somewhere, hoping something's going to kick off. So our first, the first time I really did something was a QRF where it was a daytime op. We got called a ground unit was in contact. And so they called us in, by the time we got there, they had already kind of dialed in where the enemy was, and the enemy was had effectively broken contact, and they were trying to walk us on to where the enemy was in these different orchards in some compounds, and we just couldn't see them with any optics because they were really well concealed. So we, t- we did end up taking some shots that day. We don't know if we had any, any um, confirmed hits, and that was largely the life of a pilot where you'd go out and work with any number of ground units at any given day and you will never see that ground unit again. Yeah. Like you don't know what happened. You don't know if the guys lived or died. BDA is pretty hard to assess and you're limited to two and a half hours of station time with your fuel. So best case you have two and a half hours. Yeah. Do you, do you remember about how many missions you went on where you, you fired something? A bunch. Um, God, I don't know. Several dozen, I would say were were f- at least firing 30 millimeter, we're putting yeah. rockets out. Are there a yeah. couple that stand out story-wise that yeah. are epic? Yeah. Um, I wouldn't say they're epic talking to guys like you, but... I, um, I do, shit. I mean, it's epic to, in, dude, in my opinion. No. But Yeah, there are a few for me. Um, actually, I was just thinking back on some of this, and it's usually, it, it's funny, it's the same guys that I was flying with. So we would often fly with two Apaches at any given time. You would never, ever go out solo aircraft. And there's always two guys in an Apache, two pilots. And so we'd go out as pairs of two. And I just ended up usually going out. Or when when I got into trouble, I had the same guys like in the front seat yeah. or in the back seat for me and then in our wingman aircraft. So first one for me that was most concerning was I think it was July of 2008, 
our base ended up getting attacked. And it was fairly rare for a FOB our size, a medium-sized FOB. It could take a C-130, um, but still out fairly remote to get hit. And we got hit with, we were on a night cycle. So we were sleeping during the day, <laughs> but we did know that the base was getting peppered with a little bit more contact than normal, um, being probed a little bit during the day. And we got, we got a briefing as we came on shift, pre-flight our aircraft, we went to go eat. We'd go eat. We'd call it midnight chow. Um, and basically, we're just waiting to get called. And if we don't get called in a certain amount of time, we'll go out and fly a mission to just look for something. And it's four pilots. We're the only folks sitting in this chow hall. It's quiet. We're eating. And then we get called on the radio that um, the base is starting to get attacked. So, like, suicide bombers are hitting the perimeter. Small arms fire coming over the wire mortars a little more effective or, or whatever they're shooting at us than normal and our base just r had rarely ever been hit like certainly not since we've been there it probably been five years since that place got hit like this so we i mean we're all pretty slow pilots so we run to the aircraft after eating which is not a good scenario uh, how, so how we, far is that yeah so i mean we had a gator with us you know like a little four four by four um, that got us close enough to our talk and then we'd run from there probably 200 yards maybe. So it's not far. There's no cover as you're running out. And it's the first time that I can remember like seeing rounds coming in, mm -hmm. tracers and, and gunfire that we could see and hear as pilots like outside of a cockpit. Um, so we run out, our crew chiefs are running out, and you usually have a crew chief that launches you from the pad. Um, you always do. So as we're getting into the aircraft, Again, like we're seeing rounds coming in at us, which is completely unusual for us. Um, and we're trying to tell our our crew chiefs, like, hey, just disconnect and go inside. Like, we'll be all right. Let, let us launch. And it was pretty, it was one of those moments for me, like super proud. As a commander, I'm watching my guys. Um, like, they have zero protection. Once we're in the cockpit, we've got some ballistic protection. They've got nothing. And they're standing on the wing, like getting, making sure we can launch them. Apaches are notoriously bad. We call them hangar queens because they just spend a ton of time with maintenance. There's so many avionics and advanced um, tech on them that they just break a lot. So like them being there to make sure we launch was huge and they got us off the ground and we put them in for awards later. Like uh, Apache crew chiefs aren't like um, Black Hawk or Chinook crew chiefs who get to go on missions. There's no door gunners. Like they, they don't get to go with us. Yeah. So like they, this is them putting their ass on the line for us. And it was pretty cool to see. Yeah. <clears throat> so, so we launch and as we're, t as we're getting, getting ready to take off, the radios are coming online. And part of being an aviator is just managing a ton of radios. Like you've got UHF, VHF, you've got FM, you've got HF, SATCOM, like, you're constantly talking to people like other aircraft, wingman, talk, ground force. Um, and as soon as we got on the radio there, it was immediate eruption of like everybody yelling because our base just hadn't ever really been attacked. An artillery unit was responsible for base defense and that's not their main thing. They're not an infantry unit. So they're trying to manage what's going on. And as we took off, we're, we're trying to get our bearings, usually we'd have like at least 30 minutes to talk to a ground force and get oriented on a target. Even if it's on a map here, it's immediately we're in a fight and we're taking small arms fires. We take off um, and just trying to get situationally aware. And this ground force isn't used to, to running a battle like this. So they're doing their best. They've got different optics on the wire and they're trying to talk us onto targets and so we're at Salerno and not far away is Fob Chapman, which has a lot of the special ops folks and three letter agencies. And they've got guys pouring out to get a part of this fight. So you've got artillery folks rolling out of the wire, people who we have no comms with coming outside the wire to go and fight. Um, and they're dealing with, um, you know, a pretty devastating uh, VBIED that had taken out the front gate. So they're they're just trying to manage a lot and talk us onto targets. And we're the only air cover they got. So it took us a little bit of time to get situationally aware. It's at night and we had made the mistake of putting me in the backseat. So as the commander, 
I'm typically in the front seat running the battle. I'm on the guns and the guy in the back seat is flying the aircraft. They have more spatial awareness of what's going on. The guy in the front seat is, is really narrowly focused on shooting something. And if you're the commander, you're talking to everyone, you're on the map and running the battle. But for pilots, you have to get a certain amount of time in both seats to stay qualified. So I was flying in the back seat that night and our most experienced pilot, like the godlike person in our unit was in the front seat. So this is the guy who in a moment's notice could bounce you out of the unit, like if you don't know your stuff. So you're always on edge flying with this guy and now I'm in the wrong seat and we're in a pretty chaotic environment. And we get set up and we what we do as Apaches sometimes to deconflict airspace when it gets real tight. I mean, oftentimes you'll fall into a, like a lead trail formation where you're moving around. But most of the time you don't have to. So what we'll do is on our computer screen, we'll drop this icon that's like a, a giant rectangle with a grid in it. And you'll one aircraft will put it on the uh, terrain and then text it over to the other aircraft. And then you both have the same frame of reference and you'll say, all right, you stay north of this, I'll stay south. And so as long as you can deconflict there, you don't have to worry about running into each other. So you kind of do a little orbit on either side. So that's how we deconflicted. We're both looking and trying to pick up targets. And it's really hard to discern like friend from enemy on the ground. And we finally get talked on to a couple targets. Like there's a couple folks with RPGs, like hiding in a wadi, like maneuvering. So we get talked onto that. And I am now trying to run the battle and get get my front seater set up to take a shot. So I, I come around on a on an attack profile. I get lined up and basically we're three kilometers out. I start bumping up to altitude and, and the, what you do is you, you bump up and then you get this attack profile, you kind of nose over and then you give the front seater a lot of time to, to get the, the optics on the target and then they can shoot. So we get lined up. Um, I clear him We're the radios are going nuts. And right at the last second, he's like, all right, am I clear, sir? And I said, yep, you're clear. And as soon as I said that, our wingman flew right between us and yeah. the target. And I mean, it was so disconcerting when that happened. So he did not pull the trigger then, thank God. Like we would have shot our wingman out of the sky potentially. And we're talking a distance of like a kilometer and a half. So they weren't right in front of us, but on the screen, and we're both looking now at his screen. So like I'm trying to make sure I'm oriented and I understand what he's looking at. And like the whole screen is taken up by our wingman. So I, I break, I start climbing a little bit and probably it takes me two to three seconds and he knows like I have fucked up big time. And he's like, Hey, sir, you all right? Like, can you keep flying? And, and all I wanted to say was like, can we just go home and <laughs> fucking shut this thing down? Cause yeah. I almost killed our wingman. Like these are my guys. This is my unit. I'm commanding this unit. Um, and that almost happened on my watch. And to this guy's credit, he was like, hey, we, we got this. Like, go get lined up again and let's shoot these dudes. And we did. So we came back around, got lined up, cleared us, came in, took the shot. He took him out with some 30 millimeter. And, and we were back in the fight. And I didn't think much of it again. Kind of like, you know, playing sports. Like, you got to put that, that last play behind you. Um, certainly when we landed, I was like, should I just turn in my flight suit? Like, this is crazy that that could have happened. And there was just a ton of support. Like, it, well, I mean, it, it happens to anyone. Not, not that, but like anyone in aviation is going to have a mishap or an issue. I mean, to me, I don't know shit about flying, but that seems like something that isn't so much of a mistake as it's just a, an unfortunate reality, right? I mean, what could you have done different? Yeah. So, and, and in that sense, had I spent more time in the back seat and more focused on being a backseat pilot, that would not have happened. Like if we were switched, that would not have happened. Okay. Um, I'm just used to running the battle and looking out yeah. and, and shooting, but huge learning experience. And, and there was no negative impact to me. It was very much like I owned it. 
I took it. And we did really well that night. Yeah. Um, we ended up pushing these guys off. Um, the, the attack continued into the next day with sporadic fighting, but like really once we took off and started shooting, once the Apaches were there, like people broke contact yeah. effectively. Yeah. So that was, that was great. But I will say like, that was tough for me. And we still had another seven months to go in that yeah. deployment. Man, that's an intense. So I felt uh, like crap. Oh, I can yeah. imagine. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's an intense thing. How were you guys on station that two, four, yeah, two, two and, and a half hours, and then we we would land, refuel, come back up, wow. and keep going. Um, and you have limits as to how long you can fly, depending on if you're flying MVGs, you can fly a little bit longer at night. If you're flying FLIR out of one eye, it's not very long. Like yeah. we probably had four and a half hours that we could fly at that time. Yeah. So, so that I mean, that's a pretty intense uh, kind of first scrap, if you will. Um, did that close call give you any of the? Um, the the cougar from uh, from Top Gun vibes of like almost being like the fuck am I doing? For a second, I, yeah. I think when we were up there, it did. Um, again, to this guy's credit, like keeping me in the fight, um, and, and I, I wasn't like trying to get away from it, but I think that could have gone many directions. Yeah. And that's something that teaching moment that I experienced is something I've used in the future. Like not that I've had that, but when when somebody's going through a tough time, like how you help them come out of it, yeah. I think is really important. Now I will say, um, and I'm curious where this happened in your career, Mike, for me, I, I feel like anybody in the military, at some point you have this realization that you're no longer invincible. For me though, it was a gunnery exercise in Germany a couple years before that, where we had a crew of seasoned pilots fly straight into the ground, oh, disintegrated Jesus. Um, at night, flying a new type of um, tactic that's, you know, like, we, we left the Cold War tactics behind us. We're now shooting and moving all the time. And it was my first time at night as the pilot in command. We call them PICs. That's like your progression in the cockpit where you, I was the, it was the first time I was responsible for the aircraft and the other human in it. It was at night, new tactics, firing live rounds. And then all of a sudden, like while I'm on the range, these other guys die. Yeah, and like to me, that was these were a CW three, a CW three, and a CW two, more experienced than me, and they got fixated on a target and died. So I think that was the first time I was really like, "Wow, this is no joke." Even in training, people die in aviation. Yeah. Um, so I will say, like when that the, the near shoot down was another moment of that, but I think the damage had been done for sure. Already. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that's a reminder, no, no doubt. Yeah. Um, so for for me, it was um, it was in Iraq. We had gotten ambushed, and uh, it was the first time that we had ever, you know, after pulling the trigger on somebody, being able to actually go collectively or, or you know calmly and, and relatively in a collected environment, kind of do a BDA on on bodies afterwards. Um. And and for me, that was the like, man, if this had gone the other way, they'd be around my body, yeah. poking it with a fucking stick, taking pictures, you know, yeah. like, and that, that, that was a very harsh realization for me. Um, mm -hmm. Not that I didn't know that that was possible before, but that was when it, it was like a slap in the, in the face of understanding just how fucking real, yeah. real of an environment we're in. Cause it, you know, it happens so fast as, as you know. You know, it's like, I mean, for in in that instance, one, literally one second, our boots are off and we're fucking shooting the shit to the next thing, you know, it's like a hornet's nest gets kicked over and there's fucking bullets going everywhere, flying past us, running into the vehicles and what, what have you. And, and we had to respond to it and get into like this lazy L-shaped ambush and, and shot this guy uh, that was pretty close. And then, yeah, I mean, going up afterwards, it was like, two inches and that'd be me laying there yeah. like fuck this is no shit you know but um uh in that for that deployment were there other um similarly active engagements that you had yeah um you know one story i haven't really told before it, it's not an engagement but if you give me just a moment here like i think this is i, I was flying with a guy who uh, and in this one, I was in the front seat. He was our wingman. And we had gotten called on a QRF out of coast. So those who have fought on coast is like a, a bull surrounded by mountains. So Kiowas, for instance, could only operate in the bull if, if 
attack aviation had to get outside of the bowl. It was only Apaches. So on this particular fight, there was um, a an SF team that was in contact just in the mountains, like just uh, north of the mountains from where we were. And so we took off. Our talk is getting giving us info as we're ramping up and like, here's, here's what's going on. Here's who's in contact. They're under heavy fire. And we start flying up. And weather is a huge killer for aviation. Huge killer. Um, the month before we deployed to this part of Afghanistan, two Apaches flew into a mountain from our base, like the ones that we were ripping out with. So that just they were in the clouds and flew into a mountain. So we take off. The weather is bad. The ceiling is low. And we're flying into raising terrain in Afghanistan, which is like thousands of feet So high. the best of everything. Best of everything. And it's at night. Um, kind of the tail end of our, our QRF window. So at a certain point, you almost want nothing to happen because like you're ramped up for six hours ready. And then you're kind of like mentally starting to check out and then you get called. So all of the worst factors at play and we're flying, we lose contact with our talk because we're at a range and we start picking up the ground force slightly and we're trying to get in contact. It's really spotty. And we can hear that they are in contact. And there are times like, I assume on the ground, you, you've noticed this. In the air, we'll check in with ground forces that are fat, dumb, and happy, like living large. And then sometimes like they're in the middle, like, you know, in a couple seconds, somebody could die. Yeah. And the tone and intonation of the person on the other end is very evident as you're a pilot. Like you start picking up on these. And we, at least for me as the, the flight commander, I was hearing these guys and so worried about what was going on. Like we have to get to them. And as we're flying along, like the terrain is rising and the ceiling is staying where it is. So like we're running out of room and eventually we're going to have to maneuver through this corridor. And this guy, Jason McCormick was flying in the other aircraft. And right as we took off, he's like, Hey sir, weather's bad. I don't know if we should do this. And I was like, no, no, no we're going to do this. Like these guys are in contact. We got to go. So we keep flying another two minutes. We're getting oriented. Hey, sir, like, do you see the, the clouds out there? This is pretty bad. And he's a CW2, a senior CW2. So he's not a CW4, but he's, he's respected within the team, but he's speaking to the company commander. So this isn't easy for him to call me on the op. I'm like, no, we're going to keep going. We get up into the mountains. It's like getting dicey. And he's like, sir, we got to turn back. And we can literally hear the ground force commander on the radio. Like we need support right now. And so to me, this is one of the, one of the many moments that no leadership program prepares you for. Like turn around, save four lives and two Apaches and the potential, like if we go down, the enemy's going to swarm that area. Like it's a huge PR win for them. If you can get an aircraft down but then do we leave an SF team who's in contact right now and feeling, and you can hear that it's desperate for them. Is the agency springing for a good fucking suit? No. You're no on, are not. you on the you're hook? You're on or? your own. So your suit is pretty bad, usually. <laughs> well, that seems like a fucking no-brainer. 